Alright guys, welcome to part 2 of the engine rebuild and this part is going to be about the heads. Um, it was supposed to be about the bearings, installing the bearings and measuring the clearances but the parts still haven't arrived so meanwhile I decided to do some work on the heads. And just to show you what I've done, so I've done one head right now and the other one still needs a lot of cleaning and a lot of work. So this is what the heads looked like when they came out of the car. So yeah, they definitely weren't the cleanest heads but this is after cleaning them and after porting the exhaust ports and the intake ports. So I've ported the exhaust and the intake and I've also cleaned the bearing bridges that go on top of the camshaft and also all the rockers and also cleaned out all the hydraulic lifters. Um, so yeah, th in this part I'm just going to show you how to clean everything and how to um, port the heads. So this is what the head looks like now. Um, I haven't done the best of jobs on the exhaust because the exhaust is not that important. The intake is actually the more important part. So I've done a fairly okay job on the intake, on the intake ports. Um, the intake ports actually weren't too bad on this engine to begin with like even if you look at this intake port the casting isn't too bad so I don't think it will make the biggest difference on this car porting the intake ports but still it's something that when you have everything out it's something that you might as well do. So starting off with the bearing bridges how to take the bearing bridge apart and how to actually clean it so for taking it apart there's these two rods that are running the whole length of the bearing bridge and they're what holds the rockers in place so just tap them on one side with the hammer and once they're loose you can pull them the remainder of the way out by hand and once both of these rods are out, that's all that's holding the rockers in place and then you can take the rockers off. But make sure to keep these in order because there's three different types of rockers and they all look really similar. There are four rockers that open the exhaust and they actually have a different hydraulic lifter inside them. And then there's two different um, ones for the intake valves. Once the bearing bridge was disassembled, it was time to clean everything. The easiest way I found to clean this was just to dump it in a whole bunch of gasoline. So I filled this container with gasoline and I just put all the parts in here. And then I cleaned them with a wire brush. This did take a while, it took a long time to clean this, I think it took an hour just to clean this. But here's what the results were at the end, so this is what the part looked like before I cleaned it. And this is what I, it looked like after cleaning it. But I have to say it's more important to clean the inner oil passages inside this, rather than cleaning just the outside, because the inner oil passages is where the oil will flow from and go to your lifters and everything. And after that was cleaned I also did the same for the two rods that the rockers go on and also the camshaft. So I cleaned the camshaft and then I blew air through all the oil passages just to make sure that any dirt or anything that's stuck inside the passages comes out. Just to quickly explain to you guys how the oil flows in these heads. So this bearing bridge goes somewhere over here on the engine and if you look right here on the block there's actually an oil passage. And this oil passage is what feeds oil pressure to the head and then from the head it actually goes to... There's a hole drilled in the head that leads that oil pressure to uh, this gallery over here. Which uh, from here oil goes to two places. So one from here the oil goes to your camshaft because this hole on the camshaft sits right on that groove that's over there. So the oil pressure is fed into the camshaft from here and then it flows out through the camshaft from these holes over here. And this is what lubricates your camshaft so your camshaft doesn't run dry and doesn't start scratching up the um, bearing bridge or the uh, head. And there's a bolt over here so like the gallery is open right now so you can look through the cam because this camshaft is hollow. But usually the bolt goes here and the bolt is what seals the camshaft so the oil just doesn't come out of here and actually, and it actually goes to all the bearings. The other place the oil goes is in these two, so there's these tiny holes over here. And from these holes the oil actually goes to these two shafts that go in here. And if you look right here there's actually an, a hole in the shaft so the, these shafts are hollow too. And the oil actually flows into the shaft from this hole and the oil comes out from these little holes over here. And these holes are what line up with the rockers because there is a hole, a tiny hole in the rocker over there and there is a groove over there. The groove is just so that um, when the rocker changes position it still gets oil. The hole doesn't get covered when the rocker moves to a different position. And there's actually a small line going from here to the hydraulic lifters. So that's how your hydraulic lifters get oil pressure. So the oil pressure comes in from that hole, flows through um, this rod over here, and then goes through these tiny oil passages and goes to your lifters. And here's how it goes on the rods. Here's how the whole mechanism goes together. So one thing to check for is that um, your rockers shouldn't have any play when they sit on this rod. So they can move side to side, but they shouldn't have any gap in this... Um, there shouldn't be any gap or there shouldn't be too much of a gap between this rod and the rockers. The rockers should be on pretty firm on this because if there's too much of a gap, the oil pressure wouldn't go to the lifters. It would actually, all the oil would actually flow out through the gap. Um, that's why that's one thing to check for. And the other thing to check for is just to make sure that all these oil galleries are clean because if any dirt gets in the lifters, the lifters will start ticking. 
So now getting to how to actually remove these lifters, the easiest way I found was just to put it over a socket and then use a pin. There's a tiny hole on the back of the rocker, so just insert that pin over there and hit it with the hammer a few times and the lifter just falls out. Now I've taken the hydraulic lifters to my basement and I was just cleaning them and just to tell you how to disassemble these lifters, it's super easy. You just, um, well just to show you on this one, this one's already disassembled, you just pull this thing out and this thing just comes off and then there's a spring inside this. And then uh, this part over here is where that tiny ball valve is. Uh, this is the only valve inside the lifter and this is extremely important that it should work properly otherwise your lifter will not work. And to disassemble this you just have to insert a pick on one side and then just take it off. But be careful when you take it off because there's a ball and a spring inside this and when you take this off this likes to go flying everywhere. And um, just to tell you how this works, or actually before I tell you that, just to tell you the purpose of having a hydraulic lifter as opposed to a solid lifter, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, hydraulic lifter, well the purpose of having hydraulic lifters in a car is that um, this is just a mechanism that like, this is a thing that opens up um, due to oil pressure, there's a tiny hole over here so the oil pressure actually goes in from here and it enters this um, thing over here and it opens up the hydraulic lifter. And the reason why it opens up is to fill in any free play between the rocker because your, let's say your rocker goes right here and then your camshaft goes over here. So this hydraulic lifter is the thing that goes between the valve and the rocker. So it fills in any free play in that mechanism. So like if the rocker is loose, then obviously your valve lift and your valve timing would be off. So what the hydraulic lifter does is it fills in any play and as over time your camshaft and everything wears out, um, this hydraulic lifter is basically a self-adjusting mechanism and it will keep opening up and it will still make everything work properly even when your whole thing work, uh, wears down or even due to the thermal expansion when things expand or they contract. Um, this thing will make sure that there's no free play between your rocker and um, the camshaft and the valve and all of that. As opposed to a solid lifter, which um, you might have heard of solid lifters where you need to adjust the lifters manually and they have no self-adjusting mechanism inside them. Uh, so the problem with those is you obviously have to adjust them from time to time and um, they're also noisy because on cold starts there's actually going to be some gap and then when things expand uh, the gap fills in so that's why a solid lifter never really works as well as a hydraulic lifter but the benefit of a solid lifter why some people prefer that is because it's actually lighter than a hydraulic lifter so it decreases the chances of valve float so yeah those are the differences between that and just to show you how this actually works and what you have to do to clean it there's this tiny ball over here and this ball actually seals in this hole over here so this ball actually sits right here uh, so the ball sits right here and then there's this cap that goes on it that holds this whole thing together and there's a tiny spring in here, I'm not even sure if you can see. And the reason why it's important for everything to stay so clean is because you can see how small this valve is. If any piece of dirt or anything goes inside here, um, inside this valve over here, obviously this ball wouldn't seal properly against this. And the reason why it's important for that ball to seal is because, well if you look at this lifter, right now there's air inside it. Um, if that ball isn't sealing properly, I would be able to push this um, piston in right now and the air would just leak out of here. Um, if the ball isn't sealing, but in this case the ball is sealing, that's why um, when I press this, it like no matter how long I press it for, it, it will still open back up to the same position because that means that the ball valve is sealing properly. Um, when that ball valve fails or when any dirt gets in this mechanism over here, that's when these lifters start clicking. Um, so that means that, well, oil pressure is supposed to fill in this thing and it will, it's supposed to extend this piston and open it. And then that valve over there is supposed to hold that pressure. If that valve isn't holding that pressure, then the solid lifter wouldn't work as it's supposed to. And then your valves will click because this will never um, do its function properly. Um, so when oil actually fills in this, you won't be able to compress it like this. Because air is compressible, but the oil isn't really compressible. So that, so when this is actually in the car and when this fills with oil pressure, um, it actually extends to a certain position and it actually stays there. Um, and that's what its function is. It's supposed to extend to fill in any free play in your valve and your rocker and then it's supposed to stay there. And the ball valve actually does the job of making it stay there because it's going to let oil in but it's not going to let any oil out of this mechanism. Um, so that's how it works and that's why it's important to clean it. Now to actually clean it, what I'm using is I'm just using WD-40. So uh, I'm just going to spray all this with WD-40, just get all the dirty oil out of there and make sure that everything is clean. And then Tassos actually gave me a tip to actually put one drop of oil in there before closing everything back together. So that's all I'm doing, I'm just cleaning this with WD-40, putting a drop of oil in there and then just putting all this back together. 
After everything was done with the hydraulic lifters, next I got to removing the valve springs and the valves themselves. For this I was using this valve spring compressor that I bought off Amazon, but it actually turned out to be so cheap that it bent even before I used it. That's why I had to weld that extra metal support on it, and after welding that it actually worked. Um, so all you have to do is compress the spring. With this tool you just turn the screw and that compresses the spring, and then you use a magnet to remove that um, clip that holds the valve in place. And then once the clip is removed you just uncompress the spring and then the spring can come off from the top and then the valve falls out from the bottom. And once all the valves were removed next I could remove the valve stem seals and also this um, plate that sits at the bottom of the valve springs. After the head was completely disassembled I got to the job of cleaning the head. And this also took a while because this head wasn't the cleanest either. Um, so yeah, I just used the same method, just put it in a whole bunch of gasoline and just cleaned it with the wire brush. And here's what the head looked like after an awful lot of cleaning. Once the heads were clean, I could finally get to porting the heads. The tools I'm using for this is just the Dremel with... Um, started off with this one, this is the cutting bit I'm using. This is to enlarge the ports just by a bit. Um, and then I used this one for some of the more difficult, hard to reach places. And then after that I just sand the surface to basically uh, make it more perfect to get rid of all the edges that this thing leaves, the cutting bit leaves. And then finally I used this bit for polishing. I'm just using a polish in this, a metal polish and then this thing. So yeah, I started off by that um, cutting bit. That was just to get rid of all the uneven casting that the intake manifold comes with. And also to enlarge the intake port slightly, I enlarged the intake port by 1.5 millimeters and the exhaust port by one millimeter. I don't think enlarging it would make a big difference unless the intake manifold or the intake runners are also enlarged by the same amount. But when you're getting rid of the rough casting, that's something that you'll end up enlarging the port anyways. After I was done with the cutting bit and I got rid of all the casting marks, next I used the sandpaper to um, just clean up all the rough edges that the cutting bit leaves. And after using this sandpaper, since I didn't have one of those finer sandpapers with the Dremel, I just um, I just used the regular sandpaper and just um, sanded the rest of the surface by hand. This was to get rid of all the deep scratches the coarse sandpaper leaves. And then after using the fine sandpaper, I used the polishing bit with the Dremel and that's to um, get a nice shiny finish. And I was showing you one side over here, but I did this with all, with all the sides. So like I first did this side, then I flipped the head over and did the top side and then... Um, and I did the intake runners from the other side. I pretty much covered most of it, like most of the runner. There, there are some difficult to reach places that I couldn't get to, but uh, I would say 90% of the intake runner at least was all like ported and polished. Just one thing to be extremely careful of when you're porting the heads from this side is that no cutting bit or sandpaper or anything should touch the valve seats. Because if the valve seats get scratched, that means that your valves won't seal properly. And then you'll have to reseat the valves and everything. So that's a whole other step. Um, so just be careful while doing it from this side not to damage the valve seats at all. So after the porting and polishing was done, here's what the intake runners looked like. Um, so there were still a few cuts left in there. These were the cuts from the cutting bit that the cutting bit initially left when I was cutting away all the rough casting. But all in all, it's still pretty good. I think if I sanded it a bit more, I could have even gotten rid of that. But it's not too bad. Looking at it from the other side, I also polished the combustion chambers. I didn't get rid of all the rough casting in the combustion chamber because that's a difficult process and it's also uh, highly likely that you might um, damage your valve seats while doing that. That's why I just used the polishing bit and polished up the combustion chamber, didn't um, clean up the casting. Here's what the intake runners look like from the other side. And here's what the intake runners look like, like looking at the um, bottom part. I left that bit of that area at the bottom where that um, intake runner like really close to the valve. Um, what I've heard is that leaving that area rough will help the air like turn into the combustion chamber better. I'm not sure how much of that is true. To actually test that you'll actually need a full like flow test equipment and everything. And here's what the exhaust ports look like. So the exhaust ports I didn't do as good of a job on them as the intake ports. So you can see they're not as shiny as the intake ports but they're still way better than um, what the car came with because the exhaust ports on this car were pretty rough uh, but I think that the exhaust ports just opening up the exhaust ports and like um, polishing them still wouldn't make a massive difference because the exhaust manifold in this car is extremely restrictive so measuring the sizes the exhaust manifold is actually quite a bit smaller than the size of the exhaust ports that are coming out of the heads 
So the exhaust manifold is still going to be quite a bit restrictive. I think to make the best of these changes, I'll need to go with a much larger um, exhaust manifold too. So that's everything for the heads. Talking about some other things, I'm still waiting for the parts. Well, most of the parts have arrived, but I'm still waiting for the uh, main bearings and the connecting rod bearings and a few other parts. But the problem is that um, I can't start reassembling the engine until those parts arrive because I do need those parts before I can start putting everything back together. And that's really the main delay what's um, causing all this to take that long. And really the main problem for me is that, well, the first two races of the CSCS are already over, the round one and round two. The last race of the season is in September, and I really don't think that I'll be able to get the 55 out on track before that. So yeah, judging by how long everything is taking, I don't think that I'll be able to get the 55 out on track this year. Now, I haven't really decided what to do for next year because I'm telling you about a couple of problems. The first thing is that the 55 like with the catalytic converters and everything gone, with, the, with all these engine changes, it definitely wouldn't pass any emissions regulations by next year. So I'll have to take the car off the street. I was planning to do that anyways, but uh, now for sure I'll have to take the car off the street, maybe get a trailer for it. Uh, the problem with that is that it's not going to be a street car, meaning I probably wouldn't be able to compete in the super street category, which was the category the car was the car was competing in right now. Uh, so, so I really haven't decided what to do with the car, whether to rebuild it as an unlimited car, take a whole bunch of weight out of it and um, just focus on it on being an unlimited car. My friends were even suggesting just go with a completely different chassis, just um, take everything out of the 55 and put it in a Miata chassis. Uh, I definitely won't go with that because I don't think the Miata chassis is a good chassis to go with. My favorite chassis Personally, I think the S2000 would be an amazing thing, but I think that's going to be a really pricey project to go with. But I think I'll definitely be going in the unlimited direction, whether I'm going to be like using a different chassis or really modifying the E55. I haven't decided that. I think this is a really good time to decide because the engine and everything is taken apart right now. So yeah, whatever I decide, you guys will definitely get to know in the next few weeks. I also have to say thanks a lot to Tassos. I've been in touch with him since the last few weeks, and he's also given me a lot of tips and suggestions on how to clean the parts and how to... Uh, tips on how to rebuild the engine in general. So yeah, definitely check out his channel if you haven't already. It's linked in the description. Also, thanks a lot for all the other uh, suggestions you guys gave in the comments. One person actually even commented on one of the rubber parts I found in the last video that it was from the uh, timing chain sprocket and he was right about that. So thanks a lot to him for pointing that out. And another thing, if you guys do want to send me a private message or something, I guess the best place is just to send it on my Instagram. It's linked on my channel. But anyways, that's everything for this video. Thanks a lot for watching and hopefully see you guys in the next part.